Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture on gene expression. We're going to be talking about the central dogma today or how we go from genes to proteins. The objectives for this lecture are to demonstrate an understanding of how cells use genetic information. That is, how do we go from DNA to RNA to a final protein product? We're going to define terms common to DNA, RNA, and protein. You'll be able to explain the processes of transcription and translation. You'll be able to describe factors controlling gene expression. And we'll also discuss how mutations affect protein synthesis. So genes specify proteins by transcription and translation. Gene expression is the process by which DNA directs the synthesis of proteins or RNAs. So we used to think that there was one gene to produce every enzyme, or an enzyme, by the way, is a protein that catalyzes a chemical reaction in living cells. So the old idea was there was one gene that coded for one protein. It was proposed by a pair of scientists, Beetle and Tatum. Um, now we know, or they thought that the function of a gene, sorry, dictated the production of a specific enzyme. Our newer idea came to be that one gene coded for one polypeptide. The most accurate hypothesis we have to date, and this is our working understanding in biology right now, is that one gene codes for one RNA molecule, which can be translated into a polypeptide. So let's talk more about that. We have DNA. DNA can be turned into RNA, and RNA somehow gets us to protein. So let's We'll talk more about the process and fill in some blanks on these arrows, and we'll come up with some good analogies and examples. So we call this flow of genetic information the central dogma in biology. DNA begets RNA begets protein. Transcription is the step between DNA and RNA. DNA is transcribed into mRNA. Translation is when that mRNA is used to produce a protein. And actually, there's more than one type of RNA involved in producing proteins. The ribosome, you remember from our lecture on cells, we talked about ribosomes. And you can find ribosomes in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Both types of cells do the same central dogma. DNA transcribed into RNA, translated into protein. A good example of this is to think of DNA as a cookbook. And that cookbook is locked up inside the nucleus. It can't travel to the kitchen, to the ribosomes where proteins are made. So you could think of it as a super expensive cookbook at Barnes & Noble. Maybe you run in with a recipe card. And you just want one recipe from that cookbook. So you sneak and you make a copy of a single recipe. Well, that's like messenger RNA. Mm. You can take that copy of a single recipe, sneak it out of Barnes & Noble or the nucleus, and take it home to your kitchen or a ribosome to actually make the recipe to produce the protein. So keep this analogy in mind as we talk through things. I find it's very useful. All right, and you should be filling along in your notes so that you've got the complete flow of genetic information here as well. Good. And we know DNA is housed in the nucleus. RNA can travel from the nucleus to the ribosomes where proteins are made. All right, here's another model. So in a prokaryotic cell, we have our DNA. It's transcribed to mRNA. That's the recipe card. Then it goes to the ribosome where the polypeptides are made. Now polypeptides combine to form functional proteins, right? These are long strings of amino acids. All right, in a eukaryotic cell, we have a nucleus. So there's one more level of complexity here. DNA is transcribed into mRNA. 
mRNA can exit the nucleus through a nuclear pore and travel to the ribosome where polypeptides are translated or produced. All right, so our working hypothesis in biology today is that one gene codes for a single mRNA molecule. Let's compare and contrast DNA and RNA. DNA is a nucleic acid composed of nucleotides. The same is also true for RNA. DNA is double-stranded. That's where we get that double helix shape, right? RNA, however, is single-stranded. It's like just one side of the ladder. The sugar that makes up DNA is deoxyribose. That's why we have the D here in DNA. The sugar in RNA is ribose. DNA uses nucleotides adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. RNA uses the same nucleotides but with one shift. Thymine is replaced with uracil. So if you see a sequence of nucleotides and it contains U's, you know you have to be looking at an RNA molecule. And if you're looking at a sequence of nucleotides and you see a T for thymine, you know you must be looking at DNA. DNA contains the template for producing an individual, right? RNA actually has many different roles. Here's a model of an RNA molecule. All right, so RNA plays many different roles in the cell. Let's talk more about that. Pre-mRNA is called precursor to mRNA. It's newly transcribed, but not yet edited. If you flip back to that eukaryotic cell model, oops, right here. You see in eukaryotic cells, there's this pre-mRNA molecule. It doesn't exist in prokaryotes. So there's some extra processing that RNAs do on that mRNA before it's ready to go to the ribosome. All right, let's move back to where we were. All right, mRNA is the edited version. This carries the code from DNA that specifies the amino acids to produce the polypeptide. tRNA, or transfer RNA, carries a specific amino acid to the ribosome based on its anticodon to mRNA. Our RNA makes up 60% of the ribosome. That's the site of protein synthesis. So ribosomes are mostly ribosomal RNA. All right, let's look at this now zoomed out to the beginning. If we start with the genetic code, for each gene, one DNA is the template strand. So one side of the DNA, right? We know DNA is double-stranded. And we always work from three prime to five prime. So mRNA gets billed five prime to three prime, complementary to the template. So our template DNA is the three prime to five prime strand. The mRNA complement to that looks like the matching DNA strand, doesn't it? Except instead of T's, we have U's. Thymine in DNA, but uracil in RNA. So A binds with U, C binds with G, C binds with G, and that three-letter word there is called a codon. And then you can keep going down the list in three-letter codons bits there so that you can do the whole strand. This is a task you need to be able to do for the exam. If I give you a DNA template strand, you should be able to produce the mRNA complementary strand. All right, mRNA triplets or codons code for amino acids in the polypeptide chain. And that's how we do translation. We know that UGG means tryptophan and UUU is the codon for phenylalanine and so on. 
I'll show you we have a handy chart to use to get us from the mRNA codons to the amino acids they code for. All right, so here's our mRNA codon chart. There are 64 different codon combinations here. And that's redundant because there's only 20 amino acids that exist. That redundancy is actually important in helping to minimize mistakes and problems due to mutation. All right, our reading frame is groups of three, and they have to be read together in the correct groupings, right? This code is universal. All forms of life use the same code. What do you think that says about the common ancestor to all life? It, they probably used the same RNA codon system that we still see today which is pretty incredible. All right, so transcription is the DNA-directed synthesis of RNA, how RNA is made from DNA. There's a cute little goat on. All right, uh, so transcription. A transcription unit is a stretch of DNA that codes for a polypeptide or RNA, like tRNA or rRNA. RNA polymerase, it ends with ASE, so it must be an enzyme, a protein that makes chemical reactions happen. RNA polymerase separates the DNA strands and transcribes mRNA. That mRNA elongates in the five prime to three prime direction so that it matches up with our DNA template strand that goes from 3 prime to 5 prime. Uracil replaces thymine when pairing to adenine in RNAs. And this attaches to a promoter or the start of the gene and stops at the terminator at the end of the gene. So when an mRNA molecule is made, it only covers the region of the DNA that covers the gene of interest. So whatever polypeptide it is that needs to be made, that's all the code that gets copied, right? Kind of like if you think back to your cookbook, if there's a recipe for chocolate chips that you really want, you're only gonna copy the chocolate chip recipe, right? There's no reason to include the recipes that come before or after if all you need are the chocolate chip cookies. All right, so initiation in bacteria, RNA polymerase binds directly to the promoter in DNA. So here we see the promoter. Here's our double-stranded DNA molecule. RNA polymerase binds to that promoter and it unzips DNA. That allows the RNA promoter to bind here and begin copying a complementary strand to the template strand of DNA. And the template strand is the one on top in this image because it goes from five prime to three prime. In eukaryotes, we use a different cue. So the DNA sequence in the promoter region is upstream from the transcription start site so here's where transcription needs to start. Upstream of that, so closer to the five prime end, there's something called a tata -ta box. And what it is, is it's the sequence, and we find it upstream from every gene that codes. So transcription factors recognize that tata -ta box sequence before RNA polymerase can bind to the DNA promoter. So it's a little more complicated than eukaryotes. But what makes this so cool is if we sequence the whole genome of any organism, we can identify all of the genes that code for proteins by basically doing like a control F, like you'd search on a Word document or a PDF file. And we can search for this Tata -ta box sequence and find all the coding genes in the genome. It's an incredibly powerful tool to understand that the tata -ta box is there before each coding gene. All right, so 
transcription factors in RNA polymerase together in eukaryotic cells produce the transcription initiation complex. Elongation. So we have the RNA polymerase unwinds the DNA just like it does in prokaryotic cells. And the RNA is copied complementary to the DNA strand. All right, and RNA polymerase adds RNA nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing chain. A binds with U, G binds with C. And I like this box down here to visualize that. You can see where we have the template DNA and this image is on the bottom. And then RNA is being built complementary to that. So T in the DNA means there has to be an A in the mRNA. A in DNA means a U in the mRNA. G binds with C and so on. As RNA polymerase moves, it untwists the DNA and then rewinds it after the mRNA molecule is made. So it cleans up after itself and puts the template DNA back with the complementary DNA strand when it's done making the mRNA. All right, termination. So we said there were promoters at the beginning, right? With a ta-ta box, upstream, the transcription unit, as RNA is being transcribed, the DNA gets rewound back up. And then at the end, the completed RNA transcript falls away when the promoter falls off. Sorry, not the promoter, the RNA polymerase. When the RNA polymerase falls off, the complementary um, RNA transcript or the completed mRNA molecule also falls away. So RNA polymerase transcribes a terminator sequence in prokaryotic cells or a polyadenylation signal in eukaryotic cells. Then the mRNA polymerases detach. What's important to me is you know that there's a signal in the DNA sequence that tells mRNA polymerase it's time to be done and that this mRNA transcript here is complete. All right, it's now called pre-mRNA for eukaryotes. And in prokaryotic cells, this mRNA molecule is ready to be used in the ribosome. All right. Eukaryotic cells modify that mRNA, or the pre-mRNA, after transcription. And the modifications are interesting and important. So additions to pre-mRNA... A five prime cap of modified guanine and a three prime poly A tail are added. So if this is our, the red part would be what's originally transcribed. We add a five prime cap, which is a modified guanine nucleotide with phosphate groups. And that gets added to the five prime end at the three prime end of the nRNA transcript, we get 50 to 250 adenine nucleotides added to the end. So a long string of adenines. All right, here we can also see some other things. We've got our start codon and our stop codon. This is the region that includes protein coding segments here the three-letter codons that call for amino acids. Here we have the polyadenylation signal. This is where it tells, or what told the RNA polymerase to be done, right? Good, so next step is to be exported from the nucleus. This protects the mRNA from enzyme degradation. and um, attaches mRNA to ribosomes in the cytoplasm. All right, next comes RNA splicing. And splicing 
is really interesting. So pre-mRNA has introns, and introns are non-coding sequences of DNA. Most of the A's, T's, G's, and C's that make up your genome are non-coding sequences, which is fascinating. What are they there for? And that's one of the questions biologists are working to answer still today. So anyways, pre-mRNA has this big intron in it, or sometimes they have multiple introns, non-coding sequences. They don't code for amino acids that go into a protein. And they also code for exons. Exons are the bits that do code for amino acids. Splicing is what we call the process when the introns are cut out and the exons are joined together. So here you can see the exons are these bits with numbered codons here. We splice out the introns and link together the exons that do code for things. And then the final processed mRNA molecule has that five prime cap. It's got one to contiguous coding segments of exons that have been stitched together and a poly A tail at the end. All right, here's another example of RNA splicing. If you need another image for it. Small nuclear ribonucleoproteins or SNRPs uh, are what we call um, small nuclear RNA and proteins together. So here we have small RNAs. This is an intron here. That intron is going to be cut out. And then these two exons will be stitched together. Small RNAs are important in the splicing process. So they recognize the splicing sites and the SNRPs join with other proteins to form a spliceosome. Spliceosomes catalyze the process of removing introns and joining the exons together. Ribozyme is RNA that acts as an enzyme that has a catalytic role. Catalysts, remember, are things that make chemical reactions happen faster. And in biology, we call those molecules enzymes, if they're proteins. All right, so why have introns at all if we're just going to cut them out? Well, some introns regulate gene activity. There can also be more than one way that pre-mRNA is spliced to produce different combinations of exons and different polypeptides. So now we know that one gene can actually make even more than one polypeptide. This is incredibly cool. This means that our DNA can code for exponentially more traits, characteristics, proteins, polypeptides, and RNAs than we ever thought was possible before. So if we have about 20,000 genes, that means we could have almost 100,000 different polypeptides that could be produced. All right, translation is the RNA-directed synthesis of a polypeptide. So what are the components of translation? Now that we have an mRNA molecule that's ready to rock and roll, it's left the nucleus and arrived at the ribosome, the kitchen, the recipe's ready to be cooked, right? So the mRNA molecule is the message, the messenger RNA. That's our recipe card tRNA is the interpreter, transfer RNA. The ribosome is the kitchen, that's the site of translation. All right, and here's a neat little summary. So we've got our ribosome down here. Ribosomes are made of two pieces. There's a large subunit and a small subunit. As an mRNA molecule is fed through, and that's what this red ribbon is, right? Here's the five prime cap, so that's the beginning, the poly A tail at the end. And as it gets fed through the ribosome, 
this is where translation happens. So these upside down boot shapes, these are like the tRNAs. So the tRNAs come in, they match up with the mRNA that they're complementary to, right? A binds with U, G binds with C, so ACC binds with UGG, and this tRNA is going to go off and find the amino acid that, that this codes for. So you'd figure it out by putting UGG into your codon chart and using that to figure out what the amino acid is. So let's, let's figure that out real quick. We've got UGG. What amino acid does that code for? Let's zoom back here to that codon chart. All right, UGG. So the way this works is you use this side here for your first your first codon, or sorry, your first um, nucleotide is a U, right? You said it was U, G, G. So if it's a U for the first spot, that means it has to be somewhere in this top row. We said the second mRNA base was a G, so now we know it's gotta be somewhere in this rectangle. And then we can look and find the third G for the third mRNA base. U, G, G codes for TRP, TRP is short for the amino acid tryptophan, like what's in turkey and makes us sleepy. So tryptophan is coded for by UGG. Let's head back down there. Good. So now this tRNA is going to go find a tryptophan molecule to bring in. And then it's going... So see, this one's gathered the amino acid that goes with it. Here we go. And that gets added to the growing polypeptide chain. Does that make sense? So we've got three different tRNAs all at work on three different mRNA codons at the same time. And that helps make translation more efficient. Okay, so... We've got one tRNA that's going to get the amino acid that it codes for, one that's attaching its amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain, and then another that's just bringing it in. All right, so tRNA is transcribed in the nucleus. It's specific to each amino acid. So there's 20 amino acids. There has to be, actually there's probably 64 different tRNA molecules, right? They transfer the amino acids to the ribosomes. And they are anticodons. They pair with a complementary mRNA codon. Base pairing rules between the third base of the codon and the anticodon are not as strict. And this is called wobble. It also accounts for a lot of the redundancy that we see in that codon chart. All right, let's quick skip back so I can show that to you in the chart. It was slide 22. Here we go. All right, so if we look here, we talked about the wobble in the third base of the codon. So look and see how many of these boxes does the third codon actually make a difference? Like here, as long as the first two codons are C and G, it doesn't matter what the third codon is. They all code for arginine. Here's the same for proline and leucine. The first two bases determine what the amino acid is, but the third doesn't matter. This is the wobble that I was talking about. And this redundancy is helpful because that means that almost a third of errors that could happen or mutations in the genetic code won't impact the protein of the polypeptide that's produced, which is huge. As you'll come to see, having proteins or polypeptides that aren't, they don't have the right structure, they won't have the right function either. And that's how we get a lot of different 
genetic conditions or problems with proteins that are different um, and not functional because of a change in amino acid. So wobble is important. All right. Good. So amino acetyl tRNA synthetase. This is an enzyme that binds tRNA to a specific amino acid. You don't need to know the name of this enzyme for me, but do know that it exists and an enzyme plays a role in binding tRNA to the amino acid that it, it codes for. All right, ribosomes. So we've got the large subunit and the small subunit that I mentioned. There's an mRNA molecule being fed through. And then there are those three tRNAs I mentioned, right? There's also an exit tunnel where the growing polypeptide chain feeds out of. So ribosome is made up of rRNA and proteins. It's made in the nucleolus. All right. So there's active sites. Active site A here holds the amino acid that needs to be added to the chain. P holds the growing polypeptide chain. And it also has an exit tunnel, right? E is the exit site for the tRNA. That's the tRNA that's on its way out. So translation, the first step is initiation. The small subunit of the ribosome is where the mRNA molecule attaches to. Then we have initiator tRNA that comes in. That's just the tRNA that gets the show started. Large ribosomal subunit complexes the initiation complex. So when the large ribosomal subunit kind of snaps on top, now things are starting to cook. The small subunit binds to the start codon, AUG, on mRNA. Every single mRNA molecule starts with AUG. This is the start codon. tRNA carrying methionine, that's the amino acid that's coded for by AUG. So when that methionine comes in, that attaches to the P site. So there's always a methionine is the first amino acid added to a polypeptide chain. Then the large subunit will attach. Next comes elongation. Oops. Codon recognition. So this happens when the tRNA anticodon matches to the codon in the A site. So we have to have the right tRNA that comes to bind at the A site so that it's complementary to the three-letter mRNA codon. Next, there's a peptide bond that's formed. Amino acids in the A site form bonds with the peptide in the P site. So a bond forms to be able to add that next amino acid onto the growing chain. Next is translocation. tRNA in A site moves into the P site, so everybody scooches one spot to the left. The tRNA in the P site moves to the E site, and then it can exit. Termination. This happens when the stop codon is reached and translation itself stops. There's a release factor that binds to the stop codon and the polypeptide is released. There are a few stop codons. So there's a little bit more variation here than there is with the start codon, but not a lot. All right, and then after the release factor and the polypeptide is released, the ribosomal subunits dissociate. So we go back to having a free and open small subunit for another mRNA molecule to attach to. All right, so once we have this polypeptide, how do we turn that into a protein that's ready to do work in cells? 
Well, during synthesis, the polypeptide chain coils and folds spontaneously. Kind of imagine if you had like a string of magnetic beads um, and you just kind of dropped it on the floor. It would coil up and fold onto itself spontaneously because of attraction and repulsion within the chain of magnets. Proteins aren't so different. Chaperonin is a special protein that helps polypeptides fold correctly. And this is crazy cool. Proteins don't just fold up randomly by chance or due to their uh, attractions and repulsions. They actually have to be folded deliberately in a specific way to get a correctly folded protein that's able to go and do work in cells. So structure is important, the sequence of amino acids, but also the level of structure that has protein folding is really important for getting the correct protein function. All right, so there's some post-translational modifications. So after that polypeptide is made, there are some changes that can be done. We might need to attach some macromolecules to it, like a sugar or a lipid or maybe a phosphate group. We might remove amino acids from the ends or cut the string into several pieces um, and have subunits that come together. All right, and let's talk a little bit about types of ribosomes. So there are free ribosomes. These are the ones that are located in the cytosol. They synthesize the proteins that stay in the cell and function there. Bound ribosomes, these are the ones that are studded on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. These ribosomes make proteins for the endomembrane system, for the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, and even the cell's plasma membrane itself. And it also makes proteins that are needed outside of the cell and will have to be secreted. It uses a signal polypeptide to target location. We can also have polyribosomes. So a single mRNA can be translated by several different ribosomes at the same time. And this is kind of cool. It would be like if you had multiple kitchens that were all sharing the same recipe, maybe like a fast food chain. So we have a polyribosome. It's just a string of ribosomes all working off the same mRNA molecule, producing the same growing polypeptides. So prokaryotes can also transcribe and translate at the same time. Because prokaryotic DNA isn't locked inside a nucleus, we can have transcription of the mRNA happening as, as that same mRNA molecule is being translated, which makes prokaryotic transcription and translation very efficient in time. All right, let's take a moment to talk about mutations. So mutations of one or even a few nucleotides can affect protein structure and function. So this is our central dogma. We've got DNA up here. DNA replicates. And this is a normal thing that happens as your cells divide. But sometimes there's errors, right, in that cell division, and that's where mutation can occur. After mutation occurs, transcription of that DNA into RNA by RNA polymerase produces an RNA strand. And when that RNA is translated from RNA to protein, at the ribosome, we see a protein here. So even though the mutations happen upstream in DNA, we don't often see the impact or the effect until we get to the RNA molecule sometimes, or more likely the protein that results. So structure begets function, right? Structure is the cause of function. If the structure changes, then so may the function, right? 
All right, so mutations are changes in the genetic material of a cell. That's the DNA. We can have chromosomal mutations that are large scale, and these always cause disorders or actually usually death. Um, some examples of these might be non-disjunction, translocation, inversions and duplications and large deletions. We'll talk more about these types of errors, especially non-disjunction, um, when we talk about meiosis and heredity. Point mutations change a single nucleotide pair of a gene. So just one letter. There can be a substitution where we replace one nucleotide with another. So you replace an A with a C or something like that. Often these are silent and they produce the same amino acid because of that wobble effect. Remember where we said the third letter in an mRNA codon didn't always make a difference. Sometimes you just need the first two letters and they all code for the same amino acid. All right, we could, however, have a missense. What if that substitution happened in the first or second place in a codon or a third one where it actually did make a difference? If it changes the amino acid that it's code for, that's called a missense substitution. A nonsense substitution would be when the amino acid changes to a stop codon. So it's not even an amino acid, it just says stop. It would be like if you were baking cookies and you creamed the butter and sugar together and it just said stop. Do you have chocolate chip cookies? No, you have something else <laughs> that is not going to function the same way as a chocolate chip cookie, right? Another type of mutation is called a frame shift. This is when there's an insertion or a deletion and it changes the reading frame. So remember we said those mRNA codons are read in three letter bits, right? Three letters at a time. But if we add one in there, that'll shift all the amino acids or all the codons downstream from that point are be different because of adding in one more letter. The same is also true if one letter, one nucleotide is deleted. The reading frame shifts and all of the codons downstream from that deletion or insertion mutation will be different. So it has very big impact. Usually frame shift mutations result in proteins that don't function. All right, so what causes mutation anyways? Well, mutagens. These are substances or forces that cause change in the DNA. And these are mostly things you've heard of before. Things like UV radiation can cause skin cancer, right? Causes mutation, change in the DNA of your cells. X-rays are another example of radiation that's mutagenic. There are certain chemicals that cause mutation. Things like benzoyl peroxide, which is a common ingredient in acne products. Um, smoke from barbecuing and grilling. Nitrate and nitrite preservatives and processed meats. And cigarette smoke. These are also mutagenic things. And there are even some infectious agents that are mutagenic. Um, like human papillomavirus. This is the virus that's responsible for cervical cancer. It affects and changes the DNA in host cells. All right, in Helicobacter pylori, this is another bacteria that's spread through contaminated food, but it can also have mutagenic impact on your cells. All right, so let's show you an example of a substitution that's silent. So here we have wild type just means this is the most common, um, the most common sequence or the most common that we see in a population. So here's our template DNA. Here's the mRNA that's complementary to that three prime to five prime strand. Then it produces these proteins 
when it's translated, right? Methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, and glycine. Well, if there's a substitution here where we have an A instead of a G, G, A, that's going to change this to a U instead of a C. However, GGU and GGC both code for glycine on that codon chart. So the impact is zero. There's no effect because the same polypeptide is produced, even with that mutation. And we call this a silent mutation. A missense. Here we have our wild type DNA and protein on top. This is where we have, so it's a, another substitution, a single base is different. We have a T at this spot instead of a C, which means that on our mRNA, there's an A instead of a G here. And AGC codes for the amino acid serine, whereas GGC codes for glycine. So we have a different polypeptide here. This is called a missense mutation. All right, a nonsense mutation. If we have a mutation at this location where we have an A instead of a T, that puts a U down here. And instead of coding for lysine, AAG, we have UAG, which is a stop codon. This will not function the same in a cell as this does, right? Okay. Wild type, still the same on top. But this time we're talking about a frame shift. So it's either something's been added or deleted. So if we have a nucleotide pair insertion, so we add an extra A and T here to the DNA, that means there's an extra U here and everything else downstream shifts over one letter to the right. So it used to be AUG, AAG, now it's AUG, UAA. See how the G is shifted over one spot further to the right in the mutated sequence compared to the wild type one. So everything downstream from here will be different than it is in the wild type sequence. So this has a major impact and it happens to be that this one also codes for a stop codon. It could continue to code for other amino acids and you'd have a an entirely different polypeptide, right? Okay, frame shift mutations. Here's one that causes extensive missense. So here there's been a deletion. There's an AU pair here that's been cut out. So now everything to the right of the mutation event is shifted over one spot to the left. Whoops. So our amino acids start to change and they'll all be different downstream from there. And it will produce a polypeptide that's very different from the wild type one. And will likely have a very different function. All right. Here's a three nucleotide pair deletion. So there's no frame shift because the whole codon has been removed, but one amino acid is missing. So if TTC gets cut out, then we're gonna miss that lysine, right? And that will also have a significant impact on that protein's function. So let's talk about an example. Sickle cell disease. You've all heard of sickle cell anemia? Um, it's common in sub-Saharan parts of Africa, uh, and it makes up roughly 5% of the human population. So funny thing about sickle cell anemia, if you have just one wild type gene from one parent and one of the sickle cell copies of the gene, so a mutated copy of the gene from another parent, it decreases your risk of contracting malaria significantly. And malaria is a major health problem, has been for, I don't know, millions of years, likely, in sub-Saharan Africa. 
but if you are heterozygous, if you have one normal copy of the gene and one of the sickle cell copies, you won't get sick with malaria, which is a huge benefit. However, if you have two copies of the sickle cell mutant, then you have what's called sickle cell disease. The symptoms are anemia, pain, frequent infections, delayed growth, stroke, pulmonary hypertension, organ damage, blindness, jaundice, gallstones. It significantly decreases your life expectancy, right? 42, 48 years old. Uh, and that's because the red blood cells in someone who has sickle cell disease, they have a very different shape. And that's because of a change in their hemoglobin protein. So here we have wild type hemoglobin makes a nice round red blood cell. The mRNA or the DNA is CTC, mRNA GAG, and that leads to a glutamine here in the polypeptide. For a person who has sickle cell, a sickle cell copy has an A instead of a T. That changes the second codon in the mRNA, and it means that it codes for valley now instead of glutamine. And that produces this very different shaped red blood cell with really impaired function. They don't do a great job of carrying oxygen to cells and removing carbon dioxide gas from building up. Here's a model of the protein. So this is a wild type protein. This is the sickle cell protein over here. Sickle cell hemoglobin forms long and inflexible chains, which you can see here in a model. And actually under a microscope, you can see these long chains. When normal red blood cells go through the bloodstream, they flow freely through. However, sickle cell red blood cells can actually block up because of their shape. All right, we'll talk more about lactase later. All right, so let's compare and kind of recap here. Prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. A prokaryotic cell has DNA, but it's not locked away in a nucleus, right? It's just free floating within the cytoplasm. So DNA is transcribed to produce mRNA. mRNA is translated at the ribosome to produce polypeptide chains. In eukaryotic cells, plants, animals, fungi, we have a nucleus which has a membrane with pores in it, right? The DNA is transcribed into pre-mRNA that contains introns and exons. That RNA is processed, so the introns are cut out, the exons are spliced together, and we also add that poly A tail and the, um, the modified glutamine cap. All right, then this mRNA molecule is ready to go. It leaves the nucleus through the nuclear pore and travels to the ribosome where the polypeptide is synthesized, right? So we can think of DNA as like a cookbook. mRNA is a copy of a single recipe that you can take home to your own kitchen to make a recipe, right? That would be the polypeptide would be the thing that you're cooking. All right, so prokaryotes can do transcription and translation both in the cytoplasm. In eukaryotes, they're separated. Transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytoplasm. DNA and RNA are both located in the cytoplasm of prokaryotes, not so in eukaryotic cells. RNA polymerase binds directly to the promoter in prokaryotes. In eukaryotic cells, RNA polymerase binds to that TATA -ta box and transcription factors. Either way, their function is similar. RNA polymerase has to bind upstream from where the gene actually codes for the protein. 
Transcription makes mRNA and it's not processed in prokaryotes. In eukaryotic cells, transcription makes pre-mRNA. Then we have RNA processing to produce a final mRNA. There are no introns. There are no non-coding sequences in prokaryotic genes. Eukaryotic cells have exons and introns, which are cut out. All right, so here's a nice summary slide of protein synthesis. We've got transcription that occurs in the nucleus. The mRNA leaves through a nuclear pore. It slides into the small ribosomal subunit. We get our tRNA molecules that feed in through the A, P, and then E spots in the large subunit. They go and find the matching amino acids and then add them to the growing polypeptide chain and then exit the ribosome to make room for the next one. Our most current definition for a gene is a region of DNA that can be expressed to produce a final product that's either a polypeptide or an RNA molecule. All right, and remember our analogy here for the flow of genetic information. DNA is like a cookbook that's locked away in the nucleus. RNA, or mRNA in this case, is a copy of one recipe from that cookbook that can leave the nucleus and travel to the ribosome, the kitchen, where that protein can be made. All right, so now you should be able to understand how cells use genetic information. You should understand the flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein. And you should define terms common to DNA, RNA, and protein. You should be able to explain the processes of transcription and translation. You should be able to describe the factors controlling gene expression and discuss how mutations affect protein synthesis. I recommend you write down answers <laughs> to these things. Actually define the terms, explain these processes, describe the factors, and discuss how mutations affect protein synthesis before you feel like you're done with this chapter. All right? If you have any questions, make sure you write them down. Bring them to student office hours or class so we can discuss them.